Very good. Excellent. So I'm glad to see we have a packed house tonight. And uh, I'm glad to hear that we also have many students who are online as well. Hello, everybody. Everyone knows who I am. My name is Dr. George Syed, and I'm the Dean for the College of Business here at Westcliff University. And we have a very special guest tonight that will be speaking with you. Uh, Mr. Shu, Gene Shu, yes. uh, is many things. Uh, he's a local entrepreneur and he's also a corporate consultant, amongst other things. Dr. Goodstone will speak a little bit more about his background to you. So in Westcliff's tradition of bringing you relevant, real-world business experience, we have these speakers come to us from time to time. And this lecture series is called the Professional Insight Lecture Series, because that's what you're getting. You're getting an inside look of what you're learning in the textbooks and how they're being applied in the real business world. Okay? So that's why we call it the Professional Insight Lecture Series. You're getting that insight okay, from business professionals who have many years of experience. Right? So in addition to what you learn in your textbooks and what your faculty bring to you with their experience in the classrooms, we like to take, a, we like to triangulate, if you will, and have experience outside the university come in as well to have that perspective as well, okay? So we hope you enjoy the lecture. Um, so um, Westcliff's mission to educate, inspire, and empower you is not just some words that are on a wall, but it's something that we live by. We live and breathe our mission through you every day that we're here. And we do these types of events uh, because we care about our students and we want them to be successful, not only in their tenure here at university, but all the way throughout your professional careers as well. Okay? So without further ado, let me introduce our uh, program chair for the Graduate School of Business for the Master's Program and the Doctor Program, Dr. Goodstuff. Dr. Goodstone. Wow, hi. Welcome to all of you. I'm so delighted to see you all here. And this is part of our professional insight lecture series, as you heard. And we're very fortunate to have Jean Shu here tonight, who is a local entrepreneur who specializes both in cross-cultural business between China and the West. And he works with those who are part of the Chinese business community, as well as the Americans and here in the West and our business people, and looking at cross-cultural performance mastery. And that'll be our subject for tonight. He conducts cross-cultural forums for the Orange County business community. He has over 15 years of business experience as a manager, a director, a corporate consultant with large companies such as Motorola, Electronics and Philips broad Broadband Networks. He earned his MBA from Georgia Institute of Technology. He has been a keynote speaker for universities such as UCLA, UCI, and USC. He is currently conducting a free podcast, which is available on iTunes, and he's also completing his first book. Yes, really? thank you very much. He had been living and working in Shanghai, and we're honored to have him here with us tonight to share his concept of cross-cultural performance mastery. Listen carefully and ask questions, because that's part of your professional development and what Gene wants to share with us, and to help you to find greater success in the global stage, which so many of you are part of your country and this country and growing globally as well as a business contributor. So we want to also say thank you to our professors, Dr. Asaf, Dr. Johnson, uh, Dr. Sherm, who's right here in front of me, Dr. Professor Syed, who is here, and Dr. Syed, uh, who are all here with their classes, and we really appreciate your participation. And online, we have a number of classes as well, so they'll be part of our Zoom audience. And so, without further ado, we welcome you, and thank you for your time here tonight. Okay. So thank you for the wonderful introduction. Uh, this is kind of a unique situation. I am miked, 
but there are no speakers in this room. So all of that wonderful introduction was not heard by people online. So I just want to say to the people online, uh, I'm very happy to be here, and I was given a very warm introduction. So as, as we talked about, or as Dr. Gusto introdu introduced, we're going to talk about something today called cross-cultural performance mastery. Okay, so before we begin, um, by show of hands, who is an international student? today. What we're going to talk about is a concept that I've kind of started working with. I don't know if I invented it, but I'm starting to use a term called cross-cultural performance mastery. Okay, And this is how all of you, if you listen and you absorb and you figure out how these concepts can work in your professional careers, you will be able to discover I think, your global success. Okay, so I was given a wonderful introduction, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but I do wear a lot of hats. And the reason that happens is because I stopped working in a corporate environment, and I started being an entrepreneur. Okay, so what does that mean? That means I've broadcast, I've launched a podcast. You can see me on YouTube. Okay. I have a Facebook group. I do have a company. It's called EME China Consultants. And I'm also writing a book called The China Leadership Dilemma. And we'll get into some of that as we move forward. Okay? So today, what we're really here to do is to understand how you can achieve meaningful change. Okay? So what does that mean? That means that Every one of you came from your own country where you were born and you were raised, okay? And all of you were given a lot of kind of ideas on how people should behave and how the world works, okay? And what you're going to discover as you're coming over to America or as you guys are interacting with all of these international students is that we don't have similar cultures, and sometimes we don't share similar values. Okay? Now, some countries are closer than others. For example, uh, the UK is pretty close to the United States. The United States is pretty close to Canada. Okay? But there are still differences. We're on the West Coast. I was born on the East Coast. I was born in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, so my culture, being raised in the South, is different than here in the West Coast. And it would also be different for those who are in the Northeast, like in New York or Philadelphia. Okay? So the goal is, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about things that you can apply to your experience here at Westcliff, but also things that you should develop and apply for the rest of your career, because we are becoming more and more integrated. And as we become more integrated, there are more problems, because people have different motivations, people have different politics, people have different values. Okay. Now. In spite of all of these differences that you will discover as you interact with your classmates and hopefully interact with your professors, what you're going to discover is that through these differences, you can achieve higher levels of performance if you have certain soft skills. Just call them soft skills for now. Okay? And the goal of cross-cultural performance mastery is to figure out how we can transition from what we're comfortable with, which is a comfort zone, into an achievement zone where we can exceed the expectations that others put on us and we can meet the expectations that we have for ourselves. Okay, So I want everybody to keep that in mind. 
the word performance is very, very important because as you enter the workforce, as you enter the global workforce, how you perform is going to decide how fast you advance in your career. It's going to decide how well other people are willing to work with you because after all, we all come from different backgrounds and we all come from our own cultural background or cultural heritage. And unfortunately, or maybe it's fortunate, we don't always see things the same way, okay? So this is the only part of today's lecture that's gonna be kind of like a classroom because when we talk about cross-cultural performance, we have to make sure that we have a common set of definitions. That means when I use certain terms, we have a common understanding what it actually means. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a little bit of time and just go over some very, very important terms that you can learn and then eventually figure out how it translates into your own language and figure out how to apply it to your own personal development, okay? So the first word is myopia, okay? So since a lot of you don't necessarily speak English as a first language, these terms may, may or may not be that familiar, okay? So I'm gonna just define them just to make sure we're all on the same page. So myopia is a person's misperception of reality caused by emotional factors such as pride and ego, okay? So I actually don't know what the Oxford Dictionary definition of this word is, but when I use it to train and coach my clients and my students, this is how we use it, okay? Myopia comes from inside. It comes from our pride and our ego. So a lot of cultures, especially like, you know, I do a lot of business in China. So in China, we talk a lot about giving and receiving face. And if you don't give face to somebody in China, it really doesn't matter how good your product is, they're not gonna wanna work with you. So, uh, and the reason they care so much about their face is, well, it's part of their pride and it's part of their ego. And it's part of how they react emotionally when they feel disrespected, okay? So myopia is something that all of us want to try to avoid, reduce, and eliminate. Because when we are myopic, other people don't perceive us in the most positive way, especially in a cross-cultural environment. Okay, so I just used another word. I used the word perceptions. Again, these, I don't know if these are dictionary definitions, but these are my definitions. Perceptions are feelings about a person or an event that deviate from reality. So what does that mean? That means when we meet somebody for the very first time, when we shake hands, when we start to build a relationship, everybody is guided by their perceptions, okay? How do we view our relationship with this person? Do we think we can trust this person? There's a saying here in the US that you only have one chance to make a first impression, okay? And the reason that that saying has come to the forefront is because when you are making an impression on somebody, you are influencing their perception of you, okay? In any business situation, especially in a cross-cultural business situation, how you are perceived by other people is really, really important. And the thing to keep in mind is how other people perceive you isn't necessarily who you are. That's why I say that deviates from reality, okay? If you don't manage how I perceive you, I will have a misperception. But that's not my fault. That is your fault, okay? You have to decide how to behave in order to influence how other people perceive you, okay? And this gets into the next definition word, which is awareness, okay? So awareness 
is the degree with which external perceptions, so this is by other people, context, okay, we're going to talk about that. So this is a classroom setting. I am a guest speaker. You are students. That is the situation. That is the context of our relationship. Okay, but if you go into a job interview, then the person is the hiring manager and you are a potential candidate. That is the context of the relationship. Okay, so context is important. Perceptions are important. But another thing that's really important is culture. Okay, because culture are the beliefs and the values that other people have. And only by understanding what other people value and what other people care about can you actually form a successful partnership? So this is why Westcliff is such a great platform and environment because nobody here essentially is coming from the same cultural background. So you have many, many opportunities to find out how you can collaborate with people that don't share similar culture as you. That's an opportunity I encourage all of you not to waste that opportunity, okay? So this is another word that I think is really important. This word is called empathy. And I think it's important for me to really talk about these words up front before I really get into how we apply cross-cultural performance. It's because if you don't understand the words that I'm talking about, then what I say in the future will not have any meaning, okay? So this is on a level of awareness that I have. I know that 90% of the students here are international students. Some of these terms like myopia and awareness may not be common terms that you use a lot. So my awareness tells me that I should really clarify these definitions up front before I really get started to help all of you achieve greater meaning through the rest of this presentation, okay? Mm -hmm. So empathy is the degree with which the true feelings and values of someone else is known, okay? So that means if we are meeting for the very first time and we're trying to develop a relationship and we are working together, my level of empathy means I understand what you actually value and what you actually care about. This is important in all cross-cultural situations, but think about it this way. As an American going over to China, this is especially important, okay? Because if I go to China and I talk about numbers and I talk about KPIs, I'm going to really lose my audience because, well, the Chinese care about guanxi and they care about face and they care about mianzi and they care about respect and they care about acknowledgement, okay? So through the course of your interaction, if you're not developing the guanxi and you're not giving face and you're not acknowledging their opinion, then you are really not setting yourself up to achieve a success, okay? There's another thing that we're gonna talk about a lot, okay? Uh, this is, I think, is a term that I actually invented is called AMA values, okay? So there are three major aspects of everyone's mentality that I think correspond with how you are perceived, okay? So my attitude, my mindset, and my approach, this is what other people perceive about you, okay? And the hardest thing to do is to let go of your emotions and let go of your ego and adopt a better attitude, okay? I just want everybody to be reminded how important some of these things that you can control are. So a lot of people get very, very emotional during interactions that are very disagreeable. You know, some people don't handle conflict well, okay? Some people like debate. 
Some cultures just like to debate and talk and, and share ideas, and, and it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong, everybody's just free to speak. Some cultures, if you say something wrong, it's really negative, okay? So your attitude towards those types of cultures and behaviors is very important in how you are perceived. Okay, so attitude. So I need to make sure I define all of these. Attitude is what other people care most about at the emotional level. Okay? So a lot of times when you're talking with people, talking with friends, talking with your significant other, talking with your parents, talking with whatever. Okay. Has anybody know the word sarcasm? Okay. So what does that mean? If I say something sarcastically or I say something sincerely, I can say the exact same words, but it will have a different emotional effect on you as the listener, okay? And it's because of my attitude, okay? If I say something sarcastically, that's reflected in my attitude. If I say something sincerely, that's also reflected in my attitude. So there's another word that we used in AMA. It's called mindset, okay? So mindset reflects a person's perspective and worldview, okay? And this is the key because we all come from different parts of the world, which means our mindsets are different from each other's, okay? How we view the world is highly dependent on how we were raised, how we were educated, and the environment in which we grew up, okay? The good news is, as you develop your careers on a global stage, as you enter the international workforce, your mindset is mutable. What does that mean? That means it's not fixed. You can change your perspective. You can change your worldview. Other people will influence how you perceive other people. For example, you know, if I've never had a friend that comes from, let's say, Indonesia. Anybody here from Indonesia? Okay. So, if I've never been to Indonesia and I've never met anybody from Indonesia, okay, I may have a certain perception and worldview about people from Indonesia. Okay. But then, what is your name? Anna. Anna. Nice to meet you, Anna. My name is Jean. Okay. <laughs> Now, after I meet somebody like Anna, and I start to listen to what she has to say, and I start to develop a relationship and a friendship with her, then my perspective about Indonesians can change. Okay. Now, the challenge for all of us, or for all of you, is to not wait for that opportunity to change your mindset. The challenge is to just be open-minded before you actually discover that people are more like you than you actually think. Okay, this is an attitude that I think is also really important because if you have the right attitude, you're open to new cultures and new things. You're open to people sharing disagreements, well, that can help you adjust your mindset. It can help you develop a broader worldview that can actually, that will definitely help you as you enter the global workforce, okay? Approach is the final thing in AMA values. So this is another word that maybe a lot of foreigners may not know. It's called modus operandi. Uh, for short, you'll hear people on TV saying that's his, his or her MO. Okay, so MO basically means this is how we do things naturally. This is how we prefer to behave. This is our MO. 
This is our modus operandi. It's based on our attitude and our mindset. Okay? So how we approach anything will affect how other people perceive us. Okay? So we have to be aware and conscious that we have our own preferred way of doing things. It's part of our MO. But, you know, sometimes when I go to a different culture, when you all come to, the, to America, sometimes that MO, that modus operandi that works in your country, suddenly doesn't give you the same type of responses because now you're in a different environment, now you're in a different culture, now you're working with different people. Okay? So when we take all of this that we're talking about, just still definitions, the things that we really want to focus on are adjustments. Okay? So adjustment means something you have the means or capacity to alter or enhance. Okay? Most people don't want to adjust their attitude, mindset, and approach. Most people don't even consider adjusting their modus operandi. Okay? So these people, these people who are stubborn, will really create disadvantages for themselves because it will not enable them to work with a broader spectrum of people that all have different values, that all have different cultures. So we're going to talk a lot about adjustments through the course of this presentation. Okay, So cross-cultural performance. So this is the topic today. Cross-cultural performance is all about where we are. This is our comfort zone. Okay, When we're back, for those of you who are not Americans, which is most of you, <laughs> when you come here, and you're meeting people who may behave differently, may talk differently, uh, you're really not in a comfort zone. Okay? When you go back home and, you can, and your mom is cooking dinner and you're with all your brothers and sisters and all your cousins, that's your comfort zone. Okay? Now the thing that everybody needs to imagine is as business people, we don't want to be in a comfort zone. Okay. As business people, we want to get into an achievement zone. Okay. The things that make you comfortable, the things that you are comfortable with, these are most likely the things that will lead to sometimes failure, sometimes disappointment, but ultimately these will lead to you not being able to achieve the outcomes you desire. Okay? To get from the comfort zone to the achievement zone, we have what we call internal resistance. Nobody likes to change. Nobody wants to believe that their values are not universal. Okay? We all believe that we know what we're doing and what we're doing is good and what we're doing is right, but sometimes in a different cultural context, it doesn't translate. Okay, so in order to get into the achievement zone, we have to overcome this resistance. So what happens here in the comfort zone? Okay, so these are the words that we talked about. There's a lot of myopia, which leads to complacency. We have our mindsets or perspectives or worldview, world and a lot of times it leads to judgment. So I want to stop for a second and just think about when you meet people from a different country, a different race, a different ethnicity, they talk with an accent, they don't speak the same, are you ever judgmental? Okay, you don't have to answer that in public, but you have to think about it. Okay, because if you are judgmental, that's not a good thing. Okay, that means you presume that there's something better about the way that you live your life compared to the way other people live theirs. And that's just not a good way to start. Okay? It also means you lack imagination and curiosity. And we'll talk about that. 
There's a lot of misperceptions, okay? So how other people perceive you, we've already stated that you can manage or control how other people perceive you by how you behave, okay? Now, how you perceive other people is also disconnected from reality, okay? So what that leads to is sometimes it leads to poor decision making, okay? And this is, of course, due to lack of awareness and lack of empathy, which is the definitions that we talked about. And when, when you're interacting with somebody in your comfort zone, that means the other person is not in their comfort zone. And that dialogue or that interaction, it causes a lot of negative emotions. Okay. In business, negative emotions really hurt cooperation. If you go to a different country and you want to develop a partnership what you want to avoid is negative emotions, both for yourself and for the people that you're communicating with. Okay, so when we break that resistance with greater awareness and greater empathy, okay, awareness of everything around us, the culture, the situation, okay, it helps us become more proactive. It helps us to develop greater confidence because we better understand how everything kind of works. Okay? Empathy means that instead of being judgmental, you can develop compassion. Okay? Because you understand these people or this group of people, they come from a different environment than what you're accustomed to. That's why they behave that way. And instead of being judgmental, you, you develop compassion, which is really important. And in the long run, it gives you this word. I didn't define it, but it's clairvoyance. It just, may, it just means you better understand what everybody is thinking and what everybody feels, and you can make better decisions. Okay? And when you move from the comfort zone to the achievement zone, this is a word that we use here in the U.S. a lot. Do you have passion for what you do? Okay? The reason that I'm an entrepreneur is because I have a lot of passion for the things that I'm developing, the things that I'm teaching, and the things that I'm trying to help other people to develop. It means something to me. That's why I'm happy to volunteer my time and meet all of you. Okay? It's only because I was able to transition from my comfort zone into an achievement zone that I was able to do that. So, has anybody seen, does anybody know who this is? Okay. Who has not seen this movie? Okay. Okay, so for those who have not seen this movie, you're not going to know the, does anybody not know the story of Doctor Strange? Okay. Okay, so this is very important. So when I used to run these workshops in Shanghai, and I started talking about certain things, I encouraged everybody to go watch this movie. <clears throat> okay, so very briefly, Doctor Strange is the world's most renowned neuroscientist. Okay? And he has an accident where he loses control of his hands. Okay, so he can no longer operate. And in order to find a cure, he journeys to Nepal and he tries to discover some mystical way to heal himself. It's called the mystical arts in the movie. And he is so smart and so intelligent that he is not able to get in to this kind of temple. Okay? And he finally gets one piece of advice that I think translates for us all. Okay. The master told him, you must first forget everything you know to be true. Okay. Doctor Strange is too intelligent. Doctor Strange is too smart. And that means he does not know how to embrace a new way of thinking and a new way of working. Okay. It was only after he forgot everything he knew to be true 
that he could actually begin the journey to actually develop mastery of these mystical arts if you watch the movie. Okay, so if you haven't seen the movie, I highly encourage it. Because when we talk about cross-cultural performance, essentially what we're talking about is we're talking about a journey. Okay, and the journey is continuous, where you're moving from one comfort zone into an achievement zone, and that becomes a comfort zone, and then you move into the next achievement zone. And it's basically what I call the journey to cross-cultural performance mastery. Okay, so we're going to go through some of this really quickly. I really want to get to the example at the end. But one of the things that we talked about that's really important is awareness. Okay, so you can see this is kind of a nice illustration of awareness. This is a kitten who thinks she's a tiger. Okay, this kitten lacks awareness. Okay, so this is going to be replayed on video, so you can go back and watch this if you, if you care to really figure out how this can help you in your, in, your, in your school life and in your professional life. But the questions that you want to ask yourself are, what are my experiences? And of course, this is relative to a different culture. So if you're coming from a different country, what are my experiences with American culture? What are my perceptions interacting with Americans? What is my level of cultural awareness? And what is my level of self-awareness? Self-awareness means, do I know how Americans perceive me? Okay. Now, Americans also have biases, just like anyone else. And they have, may stereotypically have certain biases towards certain groups of people. That's not necessarily good, but are you aware of that? Okay. What are the factors that you can manage and control to affect outcomes? This is what we're going to talk about. And what are the things you don't know you don't know? These are called unknown unknowns. Whenever anyone goes to a different country, goes to another cross-cultural environment, there's a lot of things they don't know they don't know. And I've been with so many Western business people who travel to China, and they completely don't know what they don't know. They're myopic, they lack awareness, and they wonder why they can't achieve the outcomes they want to achieve, okay? And all of this comes down to the thing that I think is the most important thing in business, okay? So if anybody's taking notes or mental notes, perception management is the most important thing for your career, okay? Because nobody cares how smart you are. Nobody cares what grades you got. People only care how they perceive you. So perception management, managing the perception of others is really important, okay? Perceptions of other people, that's how other people perceive you, are the gateways to achieve your desired outcomes. Okay, because in business, there is no such thing as doing something by yourself. In business, everything involves the cooperation of someone else, another stakeholder, another partner. Whether it's an employee or a colleague, it involves someone else cooperating. The good news is, and we're going to talk about this as we move forward, is the perception of other people can be influenced by levers or factors that are 100% within your control. Okay, so what we're going to talk about is how your AMA values, your attitude, your mindset, and your approach, how these things can actually be adjusted. Okay, you decide how you want to behave. You decide what your attitude is. You decide what modus operandi you're going to adopt when you go to a different country or when you come here to America. Okay, so that's perceptions of other people. Now, the other thing is your own misperceptions. So it's perceptions and misperceptions. Okay, so your misperceptions, in my opinion, are the number one cause of lost revenue, wasted expenditures, and a negative reputation for yourself and your organization. 
Okay. It's all about understanding perceptions and misperceptions. So the things that we can adjust, attitude, mindset, and approach, we call these AMA values, but really what's important is your MO or your modus operandi. Essential soft skills that matter, we talked about them, they're basically three types of awareness, self-awareness, cultural awareness, situational awareness. Self-awareness gives you insight in how you are perceived. Cultural awareness gives you insight into the behavior of others. Situational awareness gives you insight into the context or the perspective. Okay. These are what I think are the only soft skills that you really need to develop. Awareness and empathy. So empathy is obviously how do other people feel and what do they value. Okay. If I know what you feel and what you value, I'll have a much better chance of finding a mutually acceptable agreement. Okay. There are certain tools that we all have to develop soft skills. One is imagination, which has to be positive. So you want to discover understanding in the words and behaviors of others without bias or prejudice. And the other is purpose-driven curiosity. Okay, so if you think about it, being curious about somebody is the opposite of being judgmental of someone. Okay. We said at the very beginning, being judgmental is something that's actually very negative that we want to avoid. Okay? So this is basically the essential soft skills that you want to develop. Okay? Awareness, self-awareness, situational awareness, cultural awareness, and empathy, which is what other people feel and what they value. And if you want to look at what this means for cross-cultural performance mastery, it's basically this. So soft skills are the things that we develop. Okay, this helps us run. Okay, the things that we learn. Okay, everybody is here in school, so everybody knows how to learn. You know, right? you had to study to get into this school. If you're not an American, you had to pass the ESL, English as a Second Language. So you had to learn a lot to get to an institution of higher learning. Okay. What I'm showing you here about cross-cultural performance is that the things that you learn and the things that you develop really don't matter as much as the things that you adjust. Okay. Your modus operandi. Because the things that you adjust is the only thing that affects how other people perceive you. And how other people perceive you ultimately will affect the outcomes that you want to achieve. Now, the things that you develop, you can see this line, help you learn or understand what adjustments to make. But ultimately, everything in this chain is within your control. Okay? So how are we doing on time? Should we... We have another few minutes? Have another few minutes? Okay. So this is what we mean by cross-cultural performance mastery. And it's just a term. The words really don't mean that much. What really matters is are you able to consider the feelings of other people? Are you able to consider how you are perceived by other people when you engage with them, okay? When you're going on a job interview, so last time I was at UCLA and I did some mock interviews, we're doing a kind of a career workshop, and what we discovered is a lot of people don't really consider how the interviewer perceives the interviewee. I'm interviewing for a job, and in these mock interviews, all of these people just came up and they just said what they wanted to say. You know, one person, we did a mock interview, we shook hands, we sat down, and I asked, you know, tell me something about yourself. And she spent almost five minutes telling me all of her credentials. She started with, I have, I'm a something, something major, I have a 4.0 GPA, and I do this, and I do this, and I do this, and that. So, 
Just for your information, because I've interviewed a lot of people, we don't care about that. Okay, we don't care about that. Okay, everything that is on your resume or everything that's on your CV, that's the reason you're here. You don't have to say it again. Okay, I know what's on your resume. Okay, I want to know, do you have the right attitude to join our organization? Are you the right fit to be part of the team that we already have in place? Because we're adding you to our team. Okay. The only way you can cross that hurdle where the hiring manager says, I want to make you a job offer, is for you to be aware of what he actually cares about. Okay. By the time you get to the hiring manager, he doesn't care what your GPA was. Okay. He doesn't care. In fact, he probably knows. So he doesn't need you to restate that. Okay? So there are some examples. I'm going to just go through this really, really quickly. Um, so when we talk about communications versus negotiations, okay? And this is an example related to China, okay? So in level one thinking, it's from a very Western point of view. Okay, so this is what most Westerners go to China and they think, okay, for communications, it's more general, it's more long-term. Um, communications is kind of one way or two way. The intent of communicating is less specific, but when we get into negotiations, it's really specific. Okay, it's very purpose-driven. I need a short-term outcome because we need to sign the contract. Okay, there could be some gamesmanship, okay? But I also need to take a holistic view because we're in negotiations. Okay, so this is kind of a very Western point of view. When we go to a country like China and we get into level two thinking, we start looking at the Chinese point of view, you'll see that how Chinese people view communications is almost completely different than how an American may view communications. Okay, so for Chinese, people communicate with purpose. They want to develop guanxi, okay? And guanxi is based on a system of reciprocity, which means that they communicate to either give face or to receive face, okay? So they want to receive face, they want to receive recognition, but they also want to give face. This is part of their culture, okay? And you will discover that generally during communications, the Chinese are always trying to persuade you because they feel you don't understand their values and their culture. When they get into negotiations, you're going to discover that Chinese people want to conclude the negotiations as quickly as possible. Because for most Chinese people, it really doesn't matter what you put on the contract. The negotiation begins once the contract is signed and we can start working together. And we develop our guanxi over the course of working together and whatever we agree upon, we can change that as conditions change. So, they're just, they just want to get the negotiation process over with. They're going to promise everything, but sometimes it's just to give you face. And they're going to ask for everything because they just want to know where you stand on a certain issue. Okay? And they'll have a tendency to exaggerate because they just want to move to the next level or the next stage. And what happens is they're adopting a lot of kind of what I call art of war tactics. Okay. Now, I'm not saying any Chinese person has studied the art of war or has been trained in the art of war, but what I'm saying is most Chinese people, because of the environment in which they were raised, they do a lot of art of war tactics naturally. It's just how they behave. It's just how they communicate. Okay. And what we're also going to discover is that when you communicate with somebody in China, they think in a very circular manner, okay? So Americans generally think very linearly, cause and effect. Let's move from point A to point B, and then we can move to point C. But most Chinese, they think in a more circular way. And for a lot of Westerners, that's very, very frustrating. And the question that, we're not gonna get it in, into it now, but when we as Americans go to a culture like China, what AMA adjustments do we need to make? How should we adjust our attitude, mindset, and approach? What is the modus operandi or MO that will help me 
not get the contract signed, but help me develop better guanxi relationships, which is actually more important than getting the contract signed. <clears throat> okay, so that's just a very quick example. Um, that's the end of this presentation. There's a lot here. So I tried to cover a lot in a very short amount of time. Uh, I think what we're going to do is we're going to open it up for questions. Okay, so I know I've bombarded you with a lot. I think the best takeaway is it doesn't really matter what you learn. It only matters what you develop and what you adjust. Okay, so if you get poor grades, don't worry about it that much. <laughs> I was not a very good student when I was an undergrad. Uh, I did better as a graduate student, but ultimately, none of that mattered. Okay? All right, so, yes. Um, what did you do to go from your comfort zone to your achievement? Name first. Oh, yeah, my name is Jaquel. What? Jaquel. Jaquel. Yes. Okay, nice to meet you, Jaquel. Uh, what did you do to go from your comfort zone to your achievement zone? Well, that's a really good question. How did I go from my comfort zone to my achievement zone? But if you remember, I'm constantly striving for the next achievement zone. Even at my age, I feel that there's a lot that I'm not aware of. There's a lot of different types of cultures and people that I don't know how to be empathetic to. So the real question, answer that question, how do I get out of my comfort zone? Well, first of all, you have to do something that was briefly gone. You have to be able to embrace uncertainty. Okay? That means you have to enjoy something that is different. And the other thing is, the most iconic company in the world is what? What is the number one brand most valuable company in the world? Does anybody know? Apple. Apple, that's right. Apple is the number one company in the world. And Apple became successful for many reasons. But what encaps encapsulates Apple's success is two words. Does anybody know what those two words are? And what did Steve Jobs say? They hire smarter than us so they can teach us what to do. Does anybody, I, I wish I would have brought gifts. I could give gifts to the person who answers right. What's that? Stay hungry and stay foolish. Only two words. Think different. That's right. Apple, since 30 years ago, has been trying to tell everybody to think different. Okay? And if you follow the history of Apple, you can see that Apple has gone up, and then they almost went bankrupt, and then they're back up again. So what that means is, throughout your career, there's going to be ups and there's going to be downs. Okay, So we're not going to worry about that. What you have to do is you have to embrace the change and learn to think differently. And only by that attitude adjustment can you actually start to move from your comfort zone into an achievement zone. So that's an excellent question. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Come on, yes. Talked about Name first. Mo. Mo? Yeah. Okay, nice to meet you, Mo. Nice you. What country are you from? Jordan. Jordan? Okay, great. So, you know Jordan? Yeah, it's in the Middle East. We <laughs> talked about <laughs> cross culture performance and mindset awareness. Yes. I would, like, have you ever like, used stereotypes in your, like, when you were um, a manager or CEO? Yeah, so the question is have I ever used stereotypes? Yeah. And that's also an excellent question, Mo. Okay? Uh, stereotypes, unfortunately, is something that we all have. Okay? We all have our stereotypes. Okay? And that's just a reality of perceptions and being people. People that we don't know, we put them in groups. Okay? Even in politics, we put them in groups. And so stereotypes are important in, in two ways. One is you have to understand what your own stereotypes are because they reflect your biases. And in some cases, they reflect your, reflect your prejudices, okay? which is all bad. Okay? But the other thing to be aware of is the stereotype that other people have of you. So for example, 
You can tell from my accent, I'm an American. I speak English with no foreign accent because I was born and raised here in the US. Okay? When I go to China, because I look Asian and I look Chinese and I speak Chinese fluently, people don't expect me to think like Americans. Okay? And I have to be aware of the challenges that poses when I go to China, okay? Chinese have stereotypes of Americans, and a lot of it is not very positive, okay? But that's okay. Europeans have a lot of stereotypes of Americans that is not very positive, but that's okay. The important thing for all of you is to understand what those stereotypes might be and then overcome them. Okay, when you can prove somebody's stereotype of you is actually wrong, then you've taken a great next step into developing the capacity to work better with that person. Okay? Excellent question, Mo. All right? Yes? Hi, my name is Adi, and I'm from India. Uh, Agi. 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 Okay. My question for you is, uh, you said about uh, perception management being a very critical skill in your presentation. And, uh, you know, whenever we work sometimes in corporate corporate world, uh, managers or colleagues pick up on traits sometimes and develop a negative perception yep. by default. Yep. So, apart from the AMA approach which you just said, what are key things that an individual can do to transform that negative perception into positive since perception is all that matters? Yeah, so that's also an excellent question. It ties into what Mo said. A lot of people have a negative perception by default. Okay, so for example, if you're in a... So California is more diverse. Okay, but if you went to, like, Alabama, okay, not to say anything negative about the South, but if you went to Alabama uh, and you spoke the way you spoke and you looked the way you look and you think the way you think, Naturally, people may have a kind of ne negative stereotype of you. In fact, you may experience that people may not even want to talk to you or even want to work with you. Okay. The key, I think, is to only control the things that you can control. So you cannot control other people's stereotypes, biases, or even prejudices. But what you can do is you cannot let it affect your attitude, okay? No matter what you experience in that first interaction, just assume that they don't know you, they are ignorant, and then try to overcome that stereotype. Prove to them that you can communicate effectively. Prove to them that you care what they care about, right? Prove to them that you can be a good partner or a good employee, or a good customer, or a good supplier, whatever it is. That is the goal. You always want to exceed somebody's expectations, and the key is to understand what those expectations are before you even open your mouth for the very first time. Again, excellent question. We have one more question. time for one more question. My, my name's Adam. I'm sorry, say again? My name's Adam. 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 Okay. Um, which about, which country are you from? From England. From England. Okay. So you spoke about the art of war. Yes. And how transferable are those methodologies in the real world? Their art of war tactics. Yes. Uh, they're very transferable. In fact, many people have written books to translate the art of war and apply it to sales, apply it to strategy, apply it to uh, marketing, apply it to. Every business thing, the art of war, can be used. Have you used it yourself? I think I use parts of it all the time. Okay. So if you just kind of read the quotes of uh, uh, Swinze, if you just read the quotes, like whatever they are, you know, like if somebody is making a fool of themselves, just let them keep talking. I mean, <laughs> the, the laws of power as well. Yeah. I mean, these, yeah, so these things, I think in, in many different shapes and forms, people are using those all the time. And, and that's an excellent question too. So what I said about doing business in China, 
Chinese people are actually using a lot of art of war tactics, but they don't use it because they've studied it. They use it because it's natural. They use it because a lot of the way that people talk and negotiate in that culture is derived from how people haggled and how people communicated and how people fought uh, based on the art of war. So it's just natural that you will perceive some people are being deceptive. It's just natural that you will perceive some people kind of being misleading. Okay, I think the key for us when we go to China is not to interpret that in a negative way. When we think Chinese people are being disingenuous, that's not negative. That's them giving you face. That's just culture, right? To give face by definition is to be disingenuous because you want to praise somebody even though you don't think they're that good. That's giving face, <laughs> right? So the key is not to judge it. All right, so uh, thank you. I think we're done. <laughs>